It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 355 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 5th of April, 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And the only reason we're able to do this show is because of all the generous donations from our Patreon supporters. All you have to do is go to scienceontop.com slash donate and you can sign up to donate a dollar an episode or more. Uh, you'll only be charged when we release an episode, and you can put a limit on how much you donate each month, so you'll never go over budget. We really appreciate all the help we get from that point of view. It helps us pay the bills. But let's begin with mice. And researchers at the Max Planck Institute in Germany have used machine learning algorithms to finally answer one of science's most confounding puzzles. Is that mouse over there happy? or afraid, or disgusted. (laughs) Penny, it turns out you can just look at their facial expressions to learn this. Yeah, although it turns out that it might not be so much us that can tell the difference between mice facial expressions. Um, Perhaps it's other mice, but definitely using a computer vision technology, you can actually kind of help to reveal the really clear differences between mice emotions. So the way that this was done is that the mice are exposed to different triggers to get them to, I guess, have different feelings. So poor old mice, I don't think lab mice have the funnest life because these included electric shocks to the tail and lithium chloride injections, which made them feel nauseous. But they also got sweet treats. So swings and roundabouts, I guess. (laughs) Silver linings. So when the triggers were applied, um, the images of the mice were taken and the differences were compared using machine learning. And so what they show is that there seems to be about, well, six different emotional states that mice might be experiencing. So they seem to have disgust, pleasure, pain, fear, sickness and flight. So, for example, when they were sick, you know, their ears would be more flattened back and so on. Um, When it got its tail zapped in pain, its lower jaw and nose shifted. So these these facial experiments might seem quite subtle, but, I mean, I guess, you know, humans are capable of picking up quite subtle changes in other human faces. I know we've talked about studies that show that there's some facial expressions that seem pretty universal. So maybe um, the mice mice are able to do that too. So what the machine learning did is once it was given the facial expressions labelled with each emotion, when it was presented with unable facial images, it could predict the emotions captured with more than 90% accuracy. So it's showing that these expressions are very similar between mice. So again, maybe there's some kind of universal expression between mice. And they can change in sort of intensity. So, for example, if they're thirsty and they were given a really sweet drink, they seem, they they showed a happy sort of pleasure face for longer and stronger than when they got that drink when they weren't thirsty. Because, you know, think about when you're drinking cordial or something, when you are really thirsty, it feels so good compared to when you're not, even though it still tastes the same. Do you, do you think mice have the have have a, a mouse equivalent of the after they after oh, they finish that satisfying drink? <laughs> and I that's the so. other thing because I mean some of the things about facial facial expressions and emotion and blah blah blah. I mean with animals, it's always very hard to interpret it without putting the lens of our understanding because certainly mice are having these physical experiences, tasting sugar or feeling good when they do something that, you know, meets their need for homeostasis, like drinking when you're thirsty does make you feel good and so on. But the experiences of emotions and so on, that's a very subjective thing and it's very difficult to 
say that we're definitely measuring. I mean, humans might feel pleasure or happiness, you know, when they see someone they love do something good, when it's nothing really to do with us, or we might feel disgust when we just think about something yucky or we hear that someone's done something bad, even if it's not actually rotten food, which is presumably where that disgust kind of response came from. So it would be really interesting to see how mice use these facial expressions in their daily lives and what this can help us understand about animals' emotional experiences. Yeah, because I guess what we're really talking about is communication and how they communicate, not necessarily by squeaks or by smells or anything, but there's also that visual component as well, body language and facial expressions. I think... um I, I, there's no doubt that, that I've seen ex- facial expressions on other animals that are very, very clear. Um, mm. n- not mice. I don't think I've, I've kind of ever noticed it in mice, but I, I immediately think of um, many, many years ago watching an episode of Harry's Practice and Har- Dr. Harry, the vet, was telling someone how to, l- how to look after the- their budgie. <laughs> Sorry, I'm already laughing about this. <laughs> and he took... <laughs> He was saying that um, they have to clip, um, I think it was clipping the budgie's claws or something. It was a long time ago. And, and he said, and don't worry, it doesn't hurt. And he sort of, he's clipped the budgie's claw. And the budgie's face very much showed that it hurt. <laughs> it mm. kind of just pulled this face of, of ah! And then, and then he was telling him how they've got to powder it for some reason. And he, he put it in a paper bag <laughs> with powder in it and shook it. And this, this the budgie... budgie. Yeah, the budgie didn't look very happy when it came out and I had a very clear understanding from its facial expression of just how pissed (laughs) off that budgie was with Harry. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah, lots of animals clearly show their facial expressions, Uh, but I think particularly with primates and things, it's a lot more noticeable. Uh, Oh, have you seen cats? Cats, they're very clear out of what they're thinking. (laughs) Uh, I will kill you. And you, and you. (laughs) (laughs) And I will knock this glass off. Get that glass away from me or I'm knocking it off the table. (laughs) Right. And dogs, very clear when they're thinking, are you going to share that with me? That's so (laughs) obvious. Well, there you go. So most animals, I think, probably do some degree of facial expressions. We just haven't been looking for it previously, maybe. I really want to believe that as the scientists were, were, were making notes for these mice as to which expressions they, you know, they, they felt they were seeing at any given time, that they would have used a shorthand like emo- emousicons just to show you know, <laughs> the little mouse faces of how they looked at any time. I, I just want to believe that. I didn't say I was looking for it in the story. Didn't say any mention of emousicons, <laughs> but I think it was a missed opportunity, quite frankly. Emousicons. Emousicons. Well, let's move to space now. An astrophysicist from the University of Florida and Columbia University have figured out that a violent collision of two neutron stars released many of the heavier elements that went on to form our solar system. And Lucas, they've also been able to calculate when that collision probably occurred, haven't they? Yes, this has been a, a, a certainly a hunt that's been on for many many years is to try and understand you know the the progenitor star or or um whether it was a supernova or a neutron star collision one of those two would have seeded all of the materials used to create our solar system our sun and all the planets and so forth so it's never really been overly clear whether this would have been seeded by a supernova or a neutron star collision but we do know from the original LIGO detections of uh, gravity waves that um, those gravity waves helped us to understand that a neutron star collision can actually create these heavy elements. So to backtrack just a little bit, um, there's a whole lot of elements that, are, that exist in nature which are not formed in stars. So generally speaking, stars, uh, the, the biggest of all the stars, can get as far as iron, and from that point, they can't fuse iron into anything else. So 
the iron is the heaviest element that actually comes from a star from the from the fusion process uh, those stars that make iron are, are very very large much bigger than our star so our star will probably get only as far as carbon when it will just simply run out of the uh, it won't have enough gravity pressure anymore squeezing stuff together to be able to fuse carbon into any other heavier elements so the elements heavier than iron, so things like gold and um, uh, um, I've got a sudden mental blank <laughs> of other of other uh, elements. Plutonium. Uh, plutonium, yes. Uh, uh, Another one. Uh, platinum. <laughs> platinum. <laughs> The heavier That's elements. That's it. Don't test but, me anymore. Yeah, enough. <laughs> all the uraniums and all those sorts of things, um, they're heavier than gold. So if you look at them on a periodic table, they're much, much heavier. They've got uh, more atoms to make them up. Now, the way that we know that these things are made is during a process of either a supernova uh, explosion or a neutron star collision, where the neutrons in, that are produced in these two events bombard heavy elements and the bombardment of those neutrons against them causes the neutrons to peel off an electron because neutrons are neutral. They peel off an electron and then they become positively charged. So this process of these neutrons bombarding these, these uh, heavier uh, atoms uh, loads them up with extra protons. And that is the process that makes them heavier and heavier and heavier. So we've not known for, you know, up really up until recently, whether our uh, solar system was seeded by a, uh, a, an explosion of a supernova or one of these neutron star collisions. So what this team have done is they've, they've actually utilised the um, evidence in our solar system, the oldest evidence that they, that's available in our solar system, which are meteorites, um, to understand um, the makeup of the solar system when it started to form. And utilising the, uh, these meteorites, what they're able to do is, is have a look at the markers of various isotopes of different elements, of these heavy elements, which would have started radioactive decay at the time that they were ejected or created in this neutron star uh, explosion or supernova, if that had been the case. So we do know that elements have got, um, radioactive elements have got a particular time frame. We call it a half-life. So how long they're going to last on average um, before they're completely uh, uh, decayed away. And uh, this half-life is a really good indicator once you've got a, a number of these um, you know, these radioactive elements, because then uh, once, once you average them all together, you can start to wind the clock back to see exactly when they were deposited. So in addition to that, the percentage of these different isotopes that were found in these meteorites is also a fingerprint as to whether or not they come from a uh, supernova explosion or a, a neutron star uh, collision because a neutron star collision would, on average, produce significantly lower percentage of these various elements. And we can see them then in terms of their density in these, in these, um, in these meteorites. And that's indeed what they found. They found that uh, there's far too few of, these, uh, of the signatures of these radioactive decayed um, isotopes to have been from a supernova explosion. There would have been far more of them. The other thing that's very interesting is that um, once they analysed these isotopes and dialed in a neutron star, it opened up uh, the, the fascinating scenario that neutron star collisions uh, are very, very rare events. Uh, if you consider how often a supernova occurs, supernovae are, are considered to occur about every 50 years in our galaxy. And we're, we're quite overdue, by the way, for, for a decent supernova event, which seems a bit rude, frankly. Come on, solar system. Oh, come on, galaxy, get your act together. Um, whereas neutron star collisions, other, you know, instead of 50 year, you know, on average between them, these are uh, in the order of thousands of years between each of these uh, collisions. So they're far, far rarer, which means that the event which seeded our solar system uh, was actually quite a rare event, which I actually found pretty cool. Now, the other things that this team were able to dial in on 
was the time frame. And what they found was because, as I mentioned, you can wind the clock back in time from when, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the decay had finished based on its half-life uh, in these meteorites. They wound the clock back and they could see that this event, which seeded our solar system, appears to have occurred a meagre 100 million years before the birth of our solar system, which is roughly 4.6 billion years ago. That's a very, very short period of time between the event and when these uh, clumps of material started to pull together in that planetary nebula, which would have existed and seeded our solar system. We also know um, that, and this links back to another you know, very, very long-standing question in terms of the formation of a solar system, we also know that this occurred roughly a 1,000 light years away. Uh, from when it, where our, our solar system was actually born. Now, we know that our solar system, our star and all the everything that, that uh, orbits it are constantly orbiting the galaxy. So for the last 4.6 billion years, we've been moving around quite a lot. And so the, the one of these mysteries has been, as I mentioned a moment ago, finding the sister stars that would have formed out of the same planetary nebula, uh, finding the fingerprint of those stars, because they should have exactly the same fingerprint as our sun, as they formed out of the same ah. makeup of isotopes and, and elements. So they would have the same ratios. They might be different sizes, but they would certainly have the same ratios of those things, which, of course, we can find from, uh, from uh, the, the spectra, which can be analysed of any stars. And we have not found thus far any stars that are a perfect match to our sun which would be our sun's sister stars we're unique yes it does it does seem we're unique uh in that respect that our our sun has a particular fingerprint we've not found another which matches it which would be indica indicative that it formed from the same cloud and um we've certainly um you know the event that caused the creation of our solar system was also fairly rare i.e as i say it it looks like it was a, uh, a, a neutron star collision. So, you know, it does make me think about all of these questions we have as to life arising and the, the how rare certain events were that, that led to the formation of Earth. And we've talked about the collision with Theia, which caused both the moon and our axial tilt, uh, which leads to the seasons, it led to the tides, it led to, you know, so many things that are important for life which developed on Earth. We don't know whether that would be important for other things, but it certainly has had an impact on uh, the type of life that's been able to um, do well on Earth. Uh, but then when you consider that the, uh, the you know, all of the, the stuff that makes up life, which is the same stuff that's in us, it's all star stuff. So the ratios of those things, in our case, came from a particularly rare event, which is also pretty amazing to think about so the the odds of of the odds of all of these events lining up the way that they did to bring us to this this time right now is is, is very very small so it's easy to think well you know we we may well be unique until you extrapolate out of just the sheer numbers of stars in each galaxy and the sheer numbers of galaxies and the, the amount of time which has passed since then and even incredibly rare events start to become less so because there's just so many numbers involved in them. Sure. It's a numbers game. Yeah. But getting back to where you were talking about finding a sister star for our sun, uh, surely the idea that they would have the same chemical ratio as ours is kind of based on the assumption that that cloud that they're all seeded from is homogenous, that it's the same no matter where the stars form, because... I wouldn't have thought that would necessarily be the case. Uh, yes, it is based on that assumption, and the assumptions based on our observations of other star-forming regions. So, for example, the famous uh, Pillars of Creation in the Orion Nebula, um, you know, those beautiful, beautiful images that came from the Hubble Space Telescope that show these, these incredible you know, clouds of, of, uh, of stuff. Um, and in those clouds of stuff, when we, when we were able to detect um, new stars being born, as those stars begin uh, burning and, and doing their, uh, you know, the fusion thing, uh, we can, of course, you know, capture their light and, and look at their spectra. And, and when we do that, we find that stars that are born in the same region tend to have the same chemical, you know, composition. Um, the Pleiades is another good example of this. We look at the Pleiades, that group of stars, very ancient group of stars, which are a, a star cluster 
um, we can tell that they were all born together because they basically have the same, you know, the same uh, chemical makeup. So, so yeah, that's uh, you're quite right. It is based on that assumption, which is based on on the evidence that we have. A very cool story. Yeah. All right, uh, we were going to finish up with another discussion, but given that everyone is in isolation and coming to the end of their tethers and families are creating uh, hassles and (laughs) internet's not that great at the moment, uh, we're going to leave that there. So a short, sharp, sweet uh, episode, but we'll be back again next week making it bigger and better and hopefully we won't have any of the connection issues that we've had so far today. Or any Duplo being dumped in the background. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> as always all the links that we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 355 don't forget to go to scienceontop.com slash donate to sign up to patreon and help us out a bit there thanks a lot penny and lucas thanks ed thank you ed and thank you everyone for listening we'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda join us then In the language of the U.S. Department of Defense, these are unidentified aerial phenomena, videos which add fuel to the belief of some that we are not alone. All of these videos have been leaked in the past, but the U.S. government now confirms they are genuine. In a statement, the Department of Defense said it was releasing the videos in order to clear up any misconceptions by the public on whether or not the footage that's been circulating was real or whether or not there is more to the videos. The aerial phenomena observed in these videos, they say, remain characterized as unidentified. And the Nevada desert continues to attract those who believe, seriously or not, that Area 51 houses crashed alien spacecraft and their occupants. With the world gripped by more earthbound concerns right now, these videos will, for many, confirm what they've always believed that the truth is out there. Greg Milam, Sky News, Los Angeles.